All right, can you, can you see the screen with the PowerPoint on the side? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, sorry about the delay. Um, so a couple of things uh, this morning. Uh, number one, I did grade the exam. And, and granted, I didn't post the grades yet. I, I will. Okay, I will after this class. So the exam average was... I heard it was pretty bad. Well, it was 57%, uh. which is higher than, than the last test. For my other class, it was a lot lower. And so I, and for this unit, I feel that some of the problems uh, should be able to do. Let me grab my exam. And so um, what I did with the other class, and I'm going to offer the same thing to you folks, Although there was a one very high score in the exam. So I don't know if that's going to benefit that person. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you the opportunity to make up half the points you lost on the problems. Not the multiple choice, but on the problems. I will send you an email later on today with information regarding uh, making up the points. And I'll give you a couple of days to uh, do the write-ups for the problem. So uh, I'm hoping by I'm hoping by this evening I can I can I can get this done because after class I have a couple other things that need to get done. But um, so I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to make up the lost points on the exam. And for my other classes, it was a lot lower than this value. Than the other. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't divulge who had the high score, but um, anyway, um, some of the problems, and I'm not going to go around, I will give you some hints on some of the problems. For example, um, problem one, and it turns out I, I gave, I gave a, a similar problem to the other group, except that in their problem, the capacities were initially in series, and, and that one part of the part of the you guys had. Um, but I will say problem one, when you do the problem, okay, just you have two capacities in parallel, treat them as one equivalent capacitor. So you have The third capacitor, and then whatever this equivalent capacitor is. Okay? And then solve the problem this way. You've done this problem. All right? You've done this particular problem. You've done it in your homework. You've done one in class, except the one in class, I switched the plus and minus. But it's the same idea. Okay? So you use that idea. Treat these two as a single capacitor all the way until the end. And then you can answer all the questions. Okay. Yeah, so for the other class, these two capacitors were in series. So that made it, and I, I didn't foresee the difference when I made up this exam, I didn't foresee all the things that could go wrong. Uh, but they did, uh, especially for the other class. And then the second problem you need to set up Kirchhoff's laws, but in your particular case, you know, you have this, this kind of a diamond-shaped circuit. If you can assign potentials at all the points, for example, yeah, this one took me a long time. It was kind of confusing. It's arbitrary which one you call your zero, you can call it zero, then you can number all the other ones. And when you do that, when you set up Kirchhoff's laws, every single equation will have one unknown. You will not need 
to do two equations to unknown. In fact, for the nine ohm resistor, you can almost do that one in your head. Okay? Because if you use the loop rule, you have 18 volts across the power supply and 18 volts across the nine ohm resistor, that's pretty easy to figure out the current through it. Okay? The hard part comes when you have to find the, the um, current through a 12 volt battery. Because you got to use Kirchhoff's law, a current law, and you have a junction with four wires there. Okay, so that's the only hard part. So really, you should be able to set up Kirchhoff's laws with one unknown in it for each equation. Let me check out this question. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to curve this particular. So when I, so the question question is. Uh, what are the average for the exam per section? So, for the other class, it was 47. Yeah, it, um, if, if you're, is anybody else having trouble with Zoom? Because I, well, I guess we have one person who's getting kicked out. I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay. Okay, so maybe you're, you're, you're having a problem on your end, huh? Okay. Um, anyways, it's being recorded, so. Um, so the other question was, at the end of the term, do I curve the, over the whole physics to 10? I just do each, I curve over each section. I can't just do everybody's because the exams are different. Okay. So when I curve, I'm just going to curve over our group, and our group is kind of small. Um, I know I don't have a bell-shaped curve, but I'll, you know, I'll think about it at the end of the semester. Basically, as long as you're about 60%, you're going to, uh, you will definitely pass the course. Okay, and then the rest of it comes from how it all did the, the other grades. Okay, and th this course will be more difficult because it's smaller, but we'll, we'll see how it works out at the end. Typically, based on my past experience, I, if I compare doing a curve to uh, actually using my old uh, standard grading, um, I get about the same results. That's why I use the curve. Okay. But even if I even if I uh, have you guys do the, all the problems again, it's not going to. Um, I'm guessing it would raise the average maybe 15 points. I'm, 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 I'm guessing. Okay. Okay. So um, let me go back. So in this one, you need to set up Kirchhoff's law so you have one equation in each loop. And you should be able to do that. I mean, I'm sorry, one unknown for each loop. The third problem, there's a million answers to them, so it's hard for me to um, give you a good hints, except for the fact that you do not, and, and this happened in my other class, this problem was open-ended, but it shouldn't have been too bad. Because you're looking at what happens at t equals zero, and you're looking at what happens at t equals infinity, which is the steady state case, then you don't need any of the equations that, that have time in it. Because e to the infinity is zero. I'm sorry, e to the minus infinity is zero. And e to the zero is one. So again, you, you know what t is already. So you don't need the, the, the equation for uh, the exponential equation that we talked about for capacitors. You need to understand that at t equals zero, the capacitor acts like an open circuit, like a broken wire. And at t equals infinity, 
Relax. I'm sorry. He said it backwards. Let me say it the other way. Sorry. A t a t equal uh, a t equals zero acts like a wire. T equals infinity acts like a broken wire. Okay. A t equals infinity acts like an open circuit because the capacitor is totally charged. And in a couple of cases, the circuits that were drawn were such that a t equals infinity. You get zero current, but you didn't meet the requirements of the uh, of the circuit. Okay, so think about that. And then the last one, really, if you look at the last homework problem, the one with the capacitor, the same thing. If you look at the lab, part one of the lab, it's the same thing. Okay, so for problem four. You see the last homework problem. And what is sum six? What is sign assignment six? Okay. Just look at the last homework problem. It's really the same thing because when you put the bolt meter across the two parts of the circuit, right, you have that bridge. I'll draw the, I'll draw the resistance this way. You put the voltmeter here. It's behavior because this is an ideal volt meter, it has infinite resistance. It's the same thing as when you have a fully charged capacitor. There's no current going through here. So these two points don't have to be at the same potential unless your bridge is balanced. Okay, so that means these two are in series and these two are in series, just like in your lab, or what? So that's an important hint for you to be able to do this problem. If you did problem, the last problem in the homework, you should be able to do this. The only thing is this doesn't have numbers in it. Okay, so I'm hoping those things, and, I, and I'll put those things in the email I sent you. Okay, I'll send you an email, and I'll, and I'll release the score. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm making you guys anxious. Maybe I'll do it. I'll release the scores in our break, okay? Just so you can see the scores. I apologize for that, okay? Do you guys have any questions? Well, actually, yeah, well, about the, the grading, I typed it in. Uh, but, um, so when you do averages and stuff, like, is that 57% just for our section, or is it for everyone? Just for our section. Okay, and so, and then, like, at the end of the term, you're going to put combine all the sections and then curve off of that? Is I'm that gonna, how it works? Just gonna, com, I'm just going to curve off this section only. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the, the, the thing is, the exams are different. If I, oh. if I was able to give the exam... One exam at the same time, then I would do that. So with the curve, well, does that mean then that the curve would impact our class, like with a smaller like group number, more than it would impact like a full class? I don't know. I mean, I, that I don't know. Um. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say right now, I, but I think like, like on this exam, with this, with this average, an A would be um, like 80%, which would mean two people in the class I think would have gotten an A on this exam, which is right now it's 20, it's a quarter of the class, okay? So how much is that impacting the class? I mean, it's hard uh, in, in terms of compared compared to uh, the way I normally teach it. It's probably the same the same thing. Normally, I get between uh, fifteen and twenty five percent of the class getting an A. That's typical. When uh, I, I've had semesters where it's lower than that, but um, I, I think based on Doing it this way, 
I might get as many or maybe more A's than I would normally. I had one semester where I where only one student got in the class out of 27 students. And I didn't use a curve that semester. I used, I used my standard grading system. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Okay. It does. Other questions? Okay. So anyway, watch, look for my email. Um, and I think that will make a pretty good impact on you folks because then you'll have a, an exam with, uh, you know, the average part will be close to 70 now when you do this. Okay. Whereas for the other group, the average will be like 60. So what I want to, uh, some reminders, uh, don't forget how much seven do tonight, and I want to talk about a topic today that will help you do the last problem. In fact, you'll probably need this slide to help you do the last problem. I, I, did, add, I did add something to this slide at the last minute. So homework seven is due tonight, homework eight is due next week. And then the force on the wire worksheet is due on Monday. And then today we're going to do the B.O. sub I, 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 I want to see, uh, do a couple of examples of doing the calculation of B.O. sub R law. And really, to do the B.O. sub R problem, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way of determining magnetic fields for current carrying wires, really learn just to follow the process. I'm going to give you an algorithm, and it's going to be very similar to what I did for calculating electric fields. And so if you follow the process of how to do the calculation, I think you'd be okay on an exam. The worksheet that I have made for you is designed for you to follow a process. Do this, then do this, then do this. And that's how you should that's how you should work it out on the exam. Okay. All right. Um, so today I, I have a, a bunch of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about energy in the magnetic dipole. Um, because I, I neglected to discuss that last week, and it's really a quick topic. This will be a quick topic. This will take me a while, people of our law. So the three through five is basically chapter thirty. Okay. So I'm going to start, and let me start talking about energy in the dipole. And I'm going to talk about this fairly quickly. You do. There's one homework problem. Um, we talked about torque last week. The torque in the loop of wire. And we can write it in terms of the magnetic dipole moment crossing the V. Now, we either use M or mu for the magnetic dipole moment. Mu or M is N times I times the area vector. And the area vector is basically the area of the loop times the normal to the loop. And the normal is defined by the right hand rule. You curl your fingers in the direction of the current and then your thumb points in the direction of the normal to the loop. And one can spend a lot of time discussing the uh, magnetic dipole moment. For example, you can talk about the electron in an atom The, the electron orbiting uh, in an atom, you have a, basically, it's sweeping out an area. And since, the, since they, you have a charged particle moving, you're going to have a current, and it defines a, a dipole moment. And so it has a dipole moment associated with its orbital angular momentum. You can actually write the magnetic dipole moment for an electron in terms of its angular momentum, and it has important implications in the structure of the atom. The electron also has an intrinsic uh, magnetic dipole moment related to its spin. 
and the, and magnetic fields due to its intrinsic dipole moment behave differently than magnetic fields created by currents. And the big difference is this. Magnetic fields due to currents, they don't do work. But magnetic fields due to dipoles, like in a bar magnet, they can do work. Imagine you have a car at a junkyard. You have, you have a big magnet you put over the car. What's going to happen to the car? The magnet's going to lift the car up, or that magnet does work on the car. But this magnetic field is due to the intrinsic spin of the, of the atoms that make up this material. Now, you can actually put a di magnetic dipole in a non-uniform magnetic field, and then the magnetic field will do work on it, because, but a dipole is not a single charge anyway. Okay. But these dipoles store energy. And in a similar way, as we talked about the energy stored in the electric dipole, remember, if you remember from uh, earlier in the semester, the part due to an electric dipole is P cross E. And the energy stored is minus P dot E. If you take this function and you look at the torque the work done by the torque, and this is going to be m times b times the sine of the angle between these two vectors. You can show that the energy stored in the magnetic dipole is minus n dot b. Okay, just by evaluating this integral between two angles and then defining the value to be zero at uh, 90 degrees which is what we did with this guy, you'll get this expression. And this is the energy stored on a dipole in a magnetic field. Okay, and you have one problem related to this one. And that problem is really like a plug and chuck problem. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the Hall effect. And again, I'm not going to do a long discussion on the Hall effect. Consider a um, conductor carrying current I. Okay, in this, pic in this picture, the current is directed to the right. And there's a magnetic field that is directed into the plane of the screen. If you use the right-hand rule, there's going to actually be a force on the moving particles that's upward. That's true whether you're dealing with a positively charged particle moving to the right or a negatively charged particle moving to the left, as you see in the figure. Because a positively charged particle moving to the right produces the same current as a negatively charged particle moving to the left. And so you get this upward force. Now, if the charge carriers are negative, then that's going to make the electrons move towards the top of the conductor, right at the top edge. 
Well, if the electrons move to the top edge of the conductor, you're going to have a deficiency of electrons at the bottom of the conductor. They will spread out until the magnetic force is equal to the electric force. Where does the electric force come from? Well, if the charge is separated, you have positive, a lack of negative charge in the bottom, leaving positive charge in the bottom and an excess amount of negative charge on the top, leaving negatives on the top, you will have an electric field that goes from the bottom to the top of that conductor. You'll have an upward electric field. Hey, Professor. Yes. In this example here, wasn't the right-hand rule not put the force in the opposite direction? Why do you say that? B is into the plane. Am I doing it backwards? <laughs> put, put the... Oh, uh, oh, I see now. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm just doing it backwards. You know, I, I couldn't draw B. The problem is I couldn't draw B on the other side of the conductor because otherwise you can't see it. But when you, when you use the right-hand rule, the, the vectors, the tails of the vectors have to be together, right? Okay. So you have this electric field is directed upward. Charge will separate then until you reach equilibrium, until the magnetic force equal the electric force. Now, if the charge carriers were positively charged, then the positive charges would be moving up, leading to the efficiency of positive charge at the bottom. You would have an electric field directed downward. And if you have an electric field that's directed downward, then the electric potential decreases downward. So let's look at the dimensions of this thing. Uh, the thickness is T and the, the height is D. Okay. So if we use the Lorentz force, the force due to the magnetic field, and notice everything's perpendicular to each other, so it's easy for me to calculate the force due to the magnetic field. It's equal to the force due to the electric field. Now, the electric field that's produced or that's established because of the separation of charges, we call that the Hall voltage. I'm sorry, the Hall field. That's why it's called, it's, that's why you have the subscript H there. And you can, you can really solve very easily for the Hall field. It just, the drift velocity of the charge carriers times the, the magnetic field. And if the magnetic field is uniform, that also means the electric field is uniform. And if the electric field is uniform, then the potential difference is easily related to the Hall uh, field. It's just the potential difference between the top and bottom end of the conductor divided by the distance between the top and bottom end, so it's delta V over D. So delta V sub H is called the Hall voltage, and E sub H is called the Hall field. Well, if the electric field is delta V sub H over D, and that's equal to V D sub D times B, I can measure the Hall voltage. Of course, I, I need a really good vo voltmeter because these Hall voltages are like 10 to the minus 5 volts. 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 volts, typically. I can measure the magnetic field, and I know D. That means I can estimate the drift velocity of the charges in my conductor. Or, the, or it doesn't have to be a conductor. I can just, it can be some sort of system carrying charge. I can actually measure the drift velocity. Not only that, but it was this experiment that allowed you to determine whether or not it's positively charged particles or negatively charged particles moving in a circuit. Because you can tell by the direction of the electric field that's established. You can tell by, the, by the, which direction the voltage decreases. Now since I is equal to the number of particles per unit volume times the drift velocity times Q times the area. Now the area in this case is going to be D times T. Okay. 
because that's going to be the direction of the current. Then really, we, we have a bunch of things we can measure. We can actually um, write the Hall voltage in terms of the drift velocity, as you see there, times B times D. I can measure I. I can measure B. I can measure the Hall voltage and the thickness. So I can actually measure the number of charge carriers per unit volume. That's another cool thing you can do. So we could learn a lot just from this idea regarding the motion of charges in the conductor, or just the motion of the charges due to an electric field. You can design something called Hall probes to measure magnetic fields. You can calibrate a probe to very accurately measure magnetic fields. So I want to leave you with this slide. This slide will help you do the last problem in the homework. So one thing that, to, to remember, if, if you have in this figure negative charge carriers, the field will point upward. That means the, the electric potential decreases in the upward direction. Okay. Questions on this? Okay. So, that's the last thing I wanted to say about this chapter. So now I want to move to the other, the next chapter. And I just did, and thank you for reminding me to send the, the notes. I always do it at the last minute. I apologize. Uh, I want to look at chapter 30. So today I'm going to lecture on 30, next week on 31. The focus here is on sources of the magnetic field. If I had a lot of time, I can also talk about properties of magnetism, which I don't have time for. Um, but for if you're interested, you know, just read the textbook. Okay, you should read a textbook on, you know, what causes magnetism in materials. My focus is going to be in this chapter on the Biot-Savart law, the force between current carrying wires, and Ampere's law. Now, I built into these PowerPoint notes, if you look at the last slides, I went through two examples, two probably robust examples on calculating the magnetic field using the Biot-Savart Bio law. I'm not going to go through them in class, but I expect you to read through them. The more examples you see, the better. So please look at the examples that I have at the end of the notes. Okay. So our focus here is on what produces a magnetic field. Well, Ersted showed that a current in a wire produces a magnetic field. And it was discovered by accident. He accidentally discovered that a magnetic field, uh, the current produced a magnetic field by running a current in a wire, so a compass moved. Oh, what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me change the... You see it now? No, that's not the, that's not the one. Sorry. Okay. All right, that's better. It's acting, I, I added an extra camera to my system, so now it's acting kind of weird. I'm going to use a camera for a demo in a minute. Um, so anyway, his, his experiment that he showed that current carrying wires produce uh, really magnetism. Of course, we also know that magnetism is a... Uh, Manifestation 
of relativity. Now, um, Coulomb, many uh, before that, he did suggest that uh, magnetism is uh, contained within the um, particles that make up material. An Ampere at the time suggested that electric currents are the source of all magnetism. So at that time, there was a lot of interest in trying to study what are the sources of magnetic fields. Of course, there's two types. One is currents, but then one, in the case of permanent magnets, has to do with the intrinsic spin of particles, which is a more of a quantum mechanical effect, and we're not going to really focus on that in this class. Now, one of the things about what we learned regarding uh, our set experiment is the direction of the magnetic field that's produced by a current carrying wire. So if you have a long wire carrying current, the magnetic field that's, in, that's produced can be easily determined. If you curl your fingers, I'm sorry, if you point your, your thumb in the direction of the current, if you point your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers or curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Because remember, magnetic field lines, they curl, right? They circulate. So if you point your finger in the direction of the, of the current, you point, I'm sorry, if you point your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. Okay? If you point your thumb in the direction of the current, your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So I want to quickly demonstrate to you current producing a magnetic field. So um, let me switch views. So you're not going to see the PowerPoint anymore. Oops. Okay, so I'm using a different camera, and what I have here, I'll look this up, is a, um, basically a wire. I'm going to run a current through here, a very high current, so I'm basically shorting the power supply, and that's a compass. So I'm going to run a current through here, and I'm going to do this very quickly because I'm going, to, I'm going to trip the circuit breaker, okay? I'll trip that circuit breaker. So let's see if the compass moves. Okay, I just tripped the circuit breaker. Did you guys see the compass move? Yeah, it's like yeah. a helicopter. Okay, I was trying to do it with a lower current, but it wasn't working. In fact, let me try one more thing. I have here a little uh, magnet, it's basically a, a, a magnet that really can be used to determine the, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And I'm going to put it real close to the wire. I don't know if you can see this thing. Let's see if you can see it spin. Did you see it spin when they when they turn the current on? Yeah. Okay. So that that shows you that, and I tripped the circuit again. Um, that shows you that a current carrying wire produces a magnetic field. So now what we're going to do is talk about how we can calculate this. Okay, now i got to switch back. i got to switch back a couple of things. Sorry. That's one. Oops.
Fine. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Um, so, uh, let me just make sure everything's okay. Okay, so let me continue. So, I guess the question is, how can we de determine the magnetic field Can you hear me better now? Yeah, actually. Okay, I had to switch because I had too many, I have too many cameras hooked up and I couldn't use my regular microphone. Okay, that's good. Um, so now what is this, what is the, what is the way to calculate the magnetic field? So Ampere studied this and so did Bion Savar. And so they came up with really two different ways of relating the magnetic field to current. I'm going to look at B.O. Savar first. So let me write that down, French names. And they talked about the magnetic field due to a charged particle. And then we'll talk about, about it in terms of a, of a wire. And if you, have a char if you have a charged particle, Q, moving in some direction with some velocity, V, you can write the magnetic field due to a charged particle in the following way. Mu naught over 4 pi um, V cross R hat over R squared. That's the magnetic field. Oops, there's a Q here. It's missing. That's the magnetic field due to a uh, charged particle. And we're going to use this equation later this semester when I get to relativity. Okay, because I'm going to do an example involving relativity. And I want to discuss this, this, this uh, example here. Okay. Um, so basically what we have is, let's say we want to determine the magnetic field at this point, due to this charge that's moving, a moving charge produces a current. Um, our R hat is directed from the source to the point. Okay, it's the direction of the vector that points from here to here, and R is the length of this vector. Now, Bion Savar conducted experiments on wires to determine the magnetic field due to an infinitesimal length wire carrying current I. And they show that the magnetic field is perpendicular to both DS and R, which is, involves a cross product. DB is also proportional to I, proportional to um, DS, and the angle between DS and R. Furthermore, DB, for a current carrying wire, is mu naught over 4 pi, and this is the equation we're really going to be interested in. It's 
is given by this expression i times ds cross r hat over r squared. And this was determined by experimentation. And so if you have a wire and you can write your ds for a small section in a wire, you integrate over the entire wire, you can determine the magnetic field due to that wire. Of course, some, a lot of times this is a complicated integral you have to evaluate. Okay, a lot of times this is a very complicated integral. So, let me say something about mu naught. Mu naught is the analogy to epsilon naught. Epsilon naught was called the permittivity of free space. Mu naught is called the permeability of free space. It represents how the magnetic field lines penetrate a material. And by the way, when I mean free space, I mean the vacuum, okay? So we're going to be using this equation to calculate magnetic fields. So let me write the value down for mu naught. Mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla amps per meter squared. Oops, I have that backwards. It's tesla meter squared per amps. Sorry. That's what mu naught is. Now, um, when the class is on ground, I actually do an experiment, or I have you do an experiment to measure this, which is a, to me, it's a really cool experiment. Now, we can't do this on ground because it actually it requires a, you uh, building a circuit that's carrying 20 amps of current. Okay, I don't want you to do something like that at home. Okay, and it requires some expensive equipment, but this, measuring this is cool. Okay. So, how do we use this equation to calculate magnetic fields? And again, this is determined from experiment. It's not something that's derived. I mean, they did experiments and they, they noticed that uh, dB is perpendicular to both ds and r hat. Okay, and they noticed that dB is proportional to 1 over r squared. Okay. And dB is proportional to your, your dS. So how do we calculate magnetic fields due to currents? This is going to be a little bit harder than doing electric fields because the integral will contain a cross product. So we just do this step by step. First, you find the appropriate expression for ds. Second, you find an appropriate expression for your unit vector r. Then you write the appropriate expression for r hat. I'm sorry, r squared. Then you got to calculate this cross product. And then you do the integration. Okay, and of course, the first few steps are the hardest, right? Finding your ds, finding your, your r. Those are the two hardest steps. The rest of it is just straightforward because the rest of it's math. You guys know how to do the math already because you've had calculus. But it's really the first two parts of the, of the steps that are, that are the more difficult parts of the problem. Okay. So what I'm going to do is work through several examples showing you how to use the Biot-Savart law to calculate magnetic fields. Now let me say something about calculating ds cross r. It's possible that you can have situations where you have a lot of symmetry where you can pretty much figure out what ds cross r is right away. In fact, the first example I'm going to do 
uh, illustrates that. But I want to actually write out the S and write out R hat just so that you know how to de determine them just in case you need to. But I'm also going to show you by symmetry that it's, in a lot of cases it's very easy to evaluate ds cross r. So let's do an example. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out my algorithm. And really, this is how I want you to follow. This is what I want you to follow when you're solving problems. Like on an exam or in the homework. Well, in the homework, the WebAssign doesn't really have you do derivations of fields. So first, find your ds. Second, your r hat. Third, the magnitude of r squared, of r, and then square it. Fourth, calculate that. And then fifth, integrate. On an exam, if the integration is hard, what I'll probably do is say, just set up your integral and that's it. Okay? On an exam, I'll just tell you, if the, integra if the integral is hard, I'll just tell you to set up the integral and that's it. But to me, that's the most important part. That's where all the physics is at. Questions so far? Okay, so let's do our first example. So I have a loop of wire carrying current. And the current is clockwise. And let me draw a coordinate system. I want to find the magnetic field at the center at the center of the loop. You might say, well, how do you create a loop like that with the wire? Well, just you can think of maybe forming a circle and then two of the wires are coming out of the plane of the board at the top or at the bottom or, or one of the sides. So you can imagine two wires coming in this way and then there's a loop like this. Does that make sense? If you're just trying to imagine what the heck this is. So I'm going to write my, I want to figure out what ds is. I'm going to figure out what r hat is. And then we'll talk about the symmetry. Actually, if I use the right hand rule, put my thumb in the direction of the current. Let's say the, the thumb is down. Let me, let me put the thumb over here. I point my finger in the direction of the current, tangent to the current, to, to the loop, my fingers wrap around like this around the loop. So on this side of the board, my, my, my thumbs come out of the board. And I'm, I'm sorry. On this side of the board, my fingers come out of the board. On this side of the board, my fingers go into the board. Okay, when I curl my fingers that way. So into the board, out of the board. So the magnetic field circulates this way. So. So that means that inside the loop, especially over here, the magnetic field points directly straight into the board. The right-hand rule suggests B 
is directed into board. And if I call this x and this y and this z, then it's in a minus z direction. And maybe somewhere in here, it probably has two components, but over here is directly into the board. Just use the right-hand rule. So I know the field being to the board. Now, what's my DS? I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this loop of wire, and I'm going to break it up into pieces. So let me break it up into a little DS. DS points that way. ds sweeps out an angle d theta what's the magnitude of that vector what's the magnitude of ds what's the arc length how do you write arc length r d theta okay so because I'm going to write in terms of magnitude. Hold on, let me hit this. I'm sorry if I messed up the coordinate system. In the, in the, I messed up the coordinate system in the figure. Oops, that's, I went too fast. Okay, so um, now I need to find the unit vector associated with this thing. Well, you can see it has a downward component and a component to the right. If this angle is theta, this is 90 minus theta, what's this angle? Isn't that theta? Can you all see that? That this is the angle theta? Hope I didn't make that too small. Are we okay with that? That the angle that angle's theta? That the x component and the y component is co minus cosine theta j hat. And I think I messed up in my notes because I, I switched the, uh, I apologize. I really messed up everything, sorry. Well, I just, I'm gonna keep it this way for now. What's my unit vector r hat? R hat is the vector that goes from the source to the element. That's just going to be cosine of theta i hat plus sine of theta j hat. Oops, I did it the other way, wrong way, sorry. I'm just sorry. From the element to the point, sorry. So it points the other way. I messed up. Uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, why is that minus cosine theta j hat again? Oh, this one? Yeah. Because this vector points downward, right? The y component okay. is negative. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank okay. you. Yeah, it's this one that I really screwed up because it's, it, the point is here, the source is here, so I screwed that up. So what's our, what's this guy? How, what's the expression for this guy? What is the distance from here to here, anywhere around this circle? 
Isn't that just big R? It's just big R, right? And it's big R squared. So, so, so this one's just big R squared. So that's easy. So what can we say about this ds cross r? Well, first of all, the magnitude, if you take ds cross r, the magnitude is going to stay the same, right? This is a unit vector. When I take this cross product, the magnitude is going to be rd theta. And I know from the right-hand rule, that the field is going to be into the board. So this cross product, whatever it ends up being, has to be something into the board. So I know that my magnitude for ds cross r is this. My direction is going to be that. So I almost don't need to do the cross product. But if you want to do the cross product, you can, just for fun. And again, I apologize for messing up the I's and J's. And you can readily see that the I, the I and J components are going to be zero. And then if you, if you evaluate this, you get sine squared plus cosine squared. Oops, I, I forgot these are both minus, jeez. Minus sine squared minus sine squared equals minus one. Okay. Are we okay with that? So whether we do it by our, our intuition that I know the cross product is going to be a minus k direction, or I do this, this operation, I get the same thing. Okay. So now I have everything. And ds cross r is just, and, and I apologize, I have my coordinate system messed up in the, in the problem, on the, in this uh, PowerPoints. So now all we got to do is put this together. DB is mu naught over 4 pi times i. These are all constants. And I'm going to integrate ds cross r. What are my limits of integration? Zero to two pi. Zero to two pi. And is that a tough integral to do? What's the integral of, uh, of d theta? Theta. And then, and then it's from 0 to 2 pi, right? So it's just 2 pi. Yeah. Okay. If the current were in the other direction, then the field will come out towards us. If the, if the current was in the other direction, this would change directions. If the current was in the opposite direction, this would be negative and that would be positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Any questions on this? So again, find ds then r hat, then r squared, cross product, and then integrate. 
And, and the integral of this particular problem was The integral in this problem was um, fairly easy, fairly easy. Okay, let's do this one. What do you think? Well, it's the same thing, but you only integrate from zero to, what is that, pi over three? Yeah, that's it, right? So, so in this particular case, it's the same thing, but I only integrate from zero to pi over three. And this would be a 12, right? Uh, no, is that, that's not right, is it? Yeah, that's right. It's one sixth the circle, right? I forgot the minus k hat. I'm dropping, I'm dropping all kinds of signs everywhere today. Sorry. This is kind of like that problem on the homework. Um, oh gosh, I don't remember what number, but. Which one, which, which uh, chapter? Uh, the seven, chapter seven. Oh. Or was it, no, homework seven, sorry. Homework seven? <laughs> Not chapter seven, yeah. Well, it has like the two circles that have different uh, radii, and it's asking you to find the magnetic field. Um, and homework seven? I think so, yeah. Let me see, I'm opening it right now. It's number nine. Yeah, I didn't know how to do that one. <laughs> yeah, it, well, actually, I mean, it asks you to uh, calculate the magnetic dipole moment and then the maximum uh, torque. But I mean, it, it's pretty similar to what we're doing right now, I would think. Well, was that what I did at the beginning, right? It was mu dot b. You, you need to calculate for that one. Yeah. Right. The one you're talking about, no homework. You want to calculate. Oops. You just want the angle to be 180. That maximizes this. That's a dipole moment you're calculating in, in problem number nine. So basically you're taking the dipole moment times B times the cosine of 180. So yeah, regarding this one, this next problem, you only integrate from zero to pi over three. Let's do this next one. This time it's a wire. So I have a lot to say about this one, okay? In fact, I even, last semester I made a video on this problem. So I actually, I'll, I'll share you the video on YouTube for this one, except the only problem with the video I have is that the lighting's kind of weird in, in the video. You, you'll notice it. So let me, let me draw this problem. So we have, and let me draw a coordinate system. And I'm back to a conventional coordinate system in the PowerPoint slide. I don't know why I changed it in the PowerPoint slides. So I have a wire carrying current. By the way, I use the term in the notes filamentary. You see the term filamentary. Filamentary means, means a thin wire. I exaggerated the thickness, okay? I want to find the field at point P, the magnetic field at point P. Let me start by just writing the dB for this. 
Um, let me write some vectors. Um, ds. This is my ds. The ds for this one's easy to write. That's our hat. And if we use the right hand rule, I point my thumb in the direction of the current. I is this way. I is to the right. I point my thumb in the direction of my current. You can see my fingers, the way they circulate. They come, up, come out, out of the plane of the screen. So the magnetic field at point P will actually come out towards us. And then below the wire, they'll actually point into the board. Okay. So what's DS? That was easy. Our element of length is dx. What's the direction? What's the direction of the current? I hat. Which is I hat dx. All right, what's the unit vector R hat? Let me use blue for R hat. Let me define this angle theta. X component, Y component. Okay, that's R hat. What's R squared? Well, this distance, if I choose this to be x away from, uh, from here, and this distance is d, then r squared is going to be x squared plus d squared. What's ds cross r hat? Well, if you, if you do a cross product between this and this, what's I hat cross I hat? Zero. Zero. What's I hat cross J hat? K hat. K hat. It better be K hat, right? The, we know the field's going to point in K hat direction. Okay, so it's K hat. So I take this times it, I'm using the distributive law. This times this is gonna give me sine of theta d theta k hat. So then db is gonna be mu naught i over four pi uh, times ds cross r, which is gonna be sine of theta. It's dx, right? Not d theta yeah. professor. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with me this morning. We know what r squared is. Are we okay with that? So when I integrate this, I'm going to have to integrate from some initial angle to some final angle. So this is my initial angle. I'll call it theta 1. And then this angle is theta 2. By the way, you can, you can use these angles. You don't have to use these. I use these angles, but you can define everything in terms of these angles if you want. It's up to you. Okay. 
So now I want to integrate this. I have mixed things here. I have thetas and x's, and so uh, I don't like that. I'm going to put everything in terms of thetas. How's that? Let me write everything in terms of theta. So let's see. I know that tangent of theta is what? d over x. And x is going to be d over tangent of theta. But x is negative here and positive here. In fact, theta is less than 90 here and bigger than 90 here. So I have to put a minus sign here. And I'll put a minus sign here. So I'm going to let x equals minus d cotangent theta. So what's dx? What does dx become? What's the derivative of cotangent? Negative cosecant squared. Okay, so this becomes d cosecant squared theta d theta. So now we have b is u naught i over 4 pi Okay, this was kind of weird because I already had this in terms of theta. Okay. So I have sine of theta. Dx is d cosecant squared theta d theta. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have this squared. Okay, let's continue. By, by the way, before I continue, can I factor out the D? Because I'm running out of board space. You know what cotangent squared plus one is? Is it cosecant squared? Ah, cosecant squared. Wouldn't the d's cancel? Okay, so we end up with a very simple integral again. What's the integral of sine of theta? Is it minus cosine of theta? So b mu zero i over four pi d times Minus cosine of theta 2 minus cosine of theta 1. Okay. I did the whole integral just because I like doing that one. I'm going to stop after this example, then we'll take a break.
What if the wire is infinitely long? What if the wire is infinitely long? So we want to let, let L go to infinity. It wouldn't matter, right? Because at a distance away from the wire, the magnetic field is always the same, isn't it? Yeah, but doesn't the angle change? What, what is the angle when you go to minus infinity? It's zero. Basically zero, yeah. So this angle becomes zero. What's the cosine of zero? One. Okay, so this becomes one. And then what is this angle then at infinity? 180. 180, yeah. What's the cosine of 180? Uh, negative one. Oh, so it'd be... Hold on, oh. did, I make a, did I make a math error? Oh, yeah, I made a math error before. Hold on, let me rewrite this. That's what it should have looked like. Okay, I, I, I forgot the minus, I had a minus a minus here. So let's, so the minus and minus become a plus. This becomes a plus. And so cosine of 180 is negative one. Negative one times negative one is? Oh, so it becomes, okay. Becomes two, right? So for, for an infinitely long wire, becomes this. And what did I keep forgetting? The K hat. I forgot the K hat everywhere here, sorry. I was so focused on the integral, I forgot the K hat. If you see a mistake, please point it out, okay? If I forget something. I forgot the K hat. I was so focused on the integral, I forgot the K hat. A question. Yeah. If, if we had this in terms of x, like dx, what would be the limits of integral when we wanted to see the infinitely long wire? Would it be from negative infinity to positive infinity? For, well, if it was infinitely long, yeah, it would just be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. So, yeah, in, in this, I would have to write this in terms of x. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'd have to write this in terms of x, and then this would be minus infinity, that'd be plus inf uh Actually, this would be zero, and this, no, no, you're right. This would be minus infinity, that'd be like theta one. Theta one is, yeah, minus infinity plus infinity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and then this would have to be sine of theta, It would actually look more imposing to do the integral when you write it this way. Because then you'd have this uh, 3 halves power in the denominator. Right? Yeah. Are we able to use symmetry on the integral? Like we, would, we have just done 0 to theta 2. I'm sorry, say that again. Could we have just split that in half and gone from 0 to, or from, well, I guess some theta would have just been, or, you mean just use symmetry? Yeah, just for setting up the integral, like the one. Um, yeah, I got to think is the the function is. Yeah, because you have a sine of theta, you can do that, right? It would go from pi over, or pi over two to pi. Oh, I right, from ninety to. Oh, you're talking about using this angle? I'm no, not sure. No, if you use think. symmetry. Like the right like half. Looking at the right half of the wire, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, pi over 2 to pi. I'm sorry, I got mixed up. Yeah, you would go from pi over 2 to pi. And then you double it. Other questions? Okay. So um, can we take a 20-minute break?
uh, have something to eat and then come back at about 12.50? This meeting is being recorded. Okay, so we're back. So let's continue our discussion involving the BIOS, excuse me, the BIOS of our law. So I have another example. And just in case, you guys can hear me okay still, right? Yeah. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. Um, I have this one uh, example where I have a wire in that particular shape. So let me draw a picture of it. Now I want to use our knowledge that we've built up so far to calculate the field at the center of the wire. I want to calculate the, the field there. The current is I. So what can we say about the total field at point P? Well, I, I have to break this up into three parts because I have two wires here. So I'm going to call this wire one, wire two, and wire three. And I'm going to use superposition. The sum of the three gives me the field at this point. What can I say about the field due to this guy? So we, we've done this before already, right? We've done the, the, the length of the wire. So we know that for a circle. For, well, would one and three be zero, right? Yeah, can you explain why? Why, well, why because one and three be zero? The current is pointing basically at the point, so you can't have a perpendicular. There is no perpendicular field there. Like there's no way to make a perpendicular field. So what you're saying, if I'm going to interpret what you're saying. Uh, yeah, DS cross R is zero, isn't it? Correct. That, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. I'm looking for that. These two vectors are parallel to each other, right? So for wire one and wire three, DS cross R hat equals zero. Okay. But then for wire two, we just have half a circle. And you know, for a loop, we wrote B for a loop. At least the magnitude is mu zero I over two R. For a wire, long wire, The magnitude is mu sub zero i over two pi r. For a this wire, I guess this is mu sub zero i over four pi r, or r is the distance, or uh, r is the distance from the wire. Okay. I have half a loop here. Okay. So I'm going to have half of this value. So the total B, at least the magnitude, is going to be mu sub zero I over 4R. Now, what is the direction going to be in? I mean, let's take a look at this picture. And I have my goofy coordinate system again. I don't know why I did that. So what is the direction of the field going to be if I use the right-hand rule? The end of the board, right? Yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be into the board. So it'll be in a minus x direction. So really, the total field, mu zero i over... 4R times minus I hat. It's into the board. 
and really that's it okay now on an exam um, I'm probably would have you derive this express actually go through and and use the algorithm to derive the bio, uh, using the BIOS of our law because I want to see you b to be able to use this method to solve the problem okay so what I'll do in an exam I'll say use the BIOS of our law to derive it and then and then you would go through this uh, this method but uh, otherwise if I say use this fact calculate the field at this at, of this guy at the center then you wouldn't have to use all of the BIOS of our law does that make sense so anywhere along the wire if you're trying to find the field any, anywhere along a wire the field's going to be zero because ds cross r r hat is zero now i have two more examples at the end of the set of powerpoint notes okay that you can use they're, they're more difficult examples for example um the one i have is basically this one except that we're out of the we're doing the out of the plane of the board okay we're doing the problem out of the plane of the board and then there's another one for a coil all right so now that we've learned how to calculate the magnetic field due to wires i want to go back and look at the force between wires the force between current carrying wires so we're going to use something from the previous chapter along with something from what we just learned so i think i should leave this up here suppose i have two very long current carrying wires infinitely long so i can use this equation for the magnetic field due to the, due to the wire and by the way if they're not infinitely long as long as the spacing between the two wires is small then i can still use this because um, if the spacing is small, if you're standing on one of the wires and you're looking at the other wire, it's going to look infinitely long anyway. Okay, let me find an eraser. I want to know the force between two current carrying wires. So let me draw my wires. I'm going to draw them. Let me draw them in black. Both wires are carrying current. To the right. And let's consider the force. Force on I1. Due to uh, wire two, we can call it F one two if you want. I want to for find the force on this guy, this top wire, due to the bottom wire. Why is this wire going to experience a force? Well, this wire is in a magnetic field. Due to this wire. So that means I can use and then so the force of on one due to two is going to be the, the current I1 and the magnetic field due to I2. Does that make sense? Without doing a lot of math, can we figure out what's going to happen to this wire? Is it going to want to go down or up? So let's do this. Let's map out 
the field due to the, uh, on the, uh, due to the bottom wire up here. If I use my hand, right hand rule, I point my thumb in the direction of I2. My fingers wrap like this. So above the wire, the field comes towards us. Below the wire, the field's into the board. Okay. Like, let me draw this on the wire. So the field's out of the board here, but into the board down here. Okay. So let's use the right hand rule. Let me draw my coordinate system. I have a current I1 to the right and I have a magnetic field out of the board. If I use the right hand rule, I point my fingers in the direction of I1. Oh, you know what? I can't bend my fingers the other way, so I gotta flip my hand around. Now I, bend, I, I curl my fingers towards the magnetic field. My fingers point downward. So the force on one is downward. So here's my question to you. I too will also experience a force because I1 is there. What is the direction of the force on I2 due to the top wire. It would be up. It would be up. Why do you say that? Uh, well, my intuition was that just because the, the field's the opposite direction, but also because if the wire moved away from I1, then I1 would move close. I, I don't know. It's like between the two that they would get closer or farther apart, so it would be equal and opposite. Equal and oh, opposite. Oh, yeah. So what law are you quoting there? Uh, I don't know. I, that's just me thinking about it. No, but you're quoting a law when you say equal but opposite from Physics 205. What law is that? Do you remember? Oh, uh, but what a, oh shoot. Which one's that? Is it the third law? Yeah, Newton's third law. It's, it's got to be true because of Newton's third law that the forces are equal opposite. If the force on this one is down, this one's got to be up. So let me... You're right, the field down here is going to, I'm sorry, yeah, the field produced by I1, isn't it going to be into the board? Using the right hand rule? If you use the right hand rule, you'll see that the force on this guy is up. And the force on the top one's down. So they will attract each other. If, so this is weird, if they're in the same directions, they attract. Guess what happens if they're in opposite directions? They repel. They repel. Okay. So if they're in the same direction, they attract. If they're in the opposite direction, they repel. So can we calculate the magnitude of this force? Well, sure, because I know the equation for the magnetic field due to a long wire, and then I have this equation. But there's a problem with what I'm asking. What do you think the problem is? What's L for the wires? It's infinity. Yeah, that's, that doesn't make sense. I mean, the, the force is infinite. Really doesn't make sense to say what the force is, but I can always ask, what is the force per unit length on one due to two? And let's just focus on the magnitude. 
Well, that's going to be equal to the magnitude of I1 times the magnitude of B2 times the sine of 90, because they're perpendicular to each other. Our sine of 90 is 1. So then, then B2 is going to be the equation. You're just going to use this equation. And if we say the separation between these wires is D, then the distance from I1 to I2 is D. I write that. That's it. So that's the force between two current carrying wires. So all we're using is this equation and that equation to come up with it. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. What if um, we have, let me erase my board. Three wires. And a triangle. The wires are coming out towards us or into the board. So this is a current coming towards us. These two currents are into the board. And I'll call this I1, I2, and I3. And I want to find the force on I1. What do I do? What's the first thing I do? Let's see if you remember your physics 205. Draw a force body diagram. Yes, thank you. So the first thing is draw a free body diagram. So these two will repel it. I mean, because the current's in an opposite direction, you're gonna have a force that way. And these two are in opposite direction, you'll have a force that way. And then the magnitude of the force is going to be determined by this expression. The magnitude of the force between each pair is going to be determined by this expression. And then you have to break up the forces into components. All right? So determine... magnitude of F for each pair. Resolve forces. Then some components And then you know the rest from there, right? The rest is straightforward. Whether they're in the shape of a uh, triangle, rectangle, whatever, this is the, the method. We did this for charges. It's the same thing here. Use the fact that you know that they attract or repel. Now, a harder question, since we have these wires like this, would be, Calculate the field at this point due to these, these two wires. Actually, a better, one, a better one would be calculate the field at this point due to this wire and this wire. 
while I'm at it, since I have this problem, I can ask that. I can ask, what is the field at this point, at the, uh, on this wire due to these two? So let me draw, let me draw that picture. I want to redraw it because I think it's important for you to know. So if you're long wires, what shape are the field lines? They're straight or yeah. The field lines are what? I'm sorry. Are, are they're straight? What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean straight? <laughs> I mean, they don't. They don't curve. I guess I, I don't they, know. They have to curve, right? They're they're magnetic. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. They form cert. They form perfect circles. The field lines for a long wire form perfect circles. So if I want to find the field at this point due to this guy, I draw a circle that's not a good circle, sorry, centered at this point. The line tangent to this field line represents the direction of the field. The line tangent to this radius represents the direction of the field. The magnitude, of course, is, is given by, by this guy. Then I go to the top one. And I draw a circle with this point, with this as the center. That's not a good circle, okay? And then, actually I should do this. Sorry, I picked the wrong one. I do the same thing, I draw another circle and then the line tangent represents uh, the direction of the field line. So I, let, let, me, let me do this again because I said something a little bit confusing. Let me redo it. Let me redo it again. Because I was focusing on the wrong one. Okay, let me say it again because I, I said it wrong. Um, I want to find a field here. So this is the point P and this is the source. Okay, so I set it backwards. So I draw a circle representing the field due to this guy. So it should be like this. Now, since the current's into the board, the field at this point is upward. This is the field line. This is a point tangent to the curve, it's upward. So the field due to this wire at this point points upward, its magnitude is given by this equation. When I do this one, and boy, this is hard to draw. This is the distance. This is the tangent line. That's the direction of the field. This one has X and Y components. Okay. So you can find the X and Y components of the field due to this guy at this point. This is the magnitude of it. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. For the first part, I, I, I apologize. The first part I said was backwards. Okay. Now, what else can I say about current carrying wires? Well, this particular problem that you see on the screen is actually an important, an important case. Because 
if the two wires carry the same current, if the two wires carry the same current, oops, sorry, then, and let's say it's one amp, and the distance between them is one meter, then the force on them is going to be basically 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. I'm sorry, 2 pi times 10 to the minus 7. We use this to define the, the amp. You use the current in two parallel wires carrying the same current to define the amp. There's a device called a current balance that is used to measure the force between two current carrying wires. This is the, the lab I, we, we, I, uh, we do in the classes on ground. And a system such as this can be used to define the amp. Okay. Let's look at this particular case. We want to find the force on, on a wire carrying current I1. I'm sorry. I want to find the force on a loop of wire carrying current I2 due to the long wire at the top. Is the force going to be zero? That's my question. Is the force going to be zero? It shouldn't be zero, right? Why not? Oh wait, is there current going through the loop or not? There's a current I there's a current I I2 going through the loop. Hmm. And yeah, it should, yeah. I'm sorry? It shouldn't be zero. It shouldn't be zero. And then the question the reason is why. Uh because the um well I one imposes a a force on it and also does it I2 and pose a force as well? Well we want to look at the force on the loop due to I1. Oh wait. Oh I thought really okay. I was confused reading the problem. You're right, the force is not zero. Right? You're, you're right that the force is not zero. The question is why? Because the loop creates a field outside and inside. Now, what do we say about... Well, first of all, we said last week that if you have a loop of wire in a uniform field, the, the, the force is zero. Is the field uniform here all the way around the loop, all, over the entire loop? Is the field constant as you go this direction? No, yeah, because the bottom's farther away than the... Yeah, the field, the, so oh. the field is not uniform, so the, the force isn't necessarily zero. So let me ask about these two sides. This side and this side, the force on these two sides. I mean, do I have to do the calculation for every single side uh, that makes up this rectangle? No. No, they're, they're, these two cancel out, why? Well, they're the same length and they're carrying currents in the opposite direction. Does that make sense? The force on this leg and this leg, they cancel out. This force plus this force equals zero. And you'll find that the force on, on uh, 
This one's to the left, and then this one's to the right. The force on this one's going to be upward. The force on this one's going to be downward. Because these two are parallel, these two are opposite. I can just write this down. I can actually write the answer down because I have the equation. I have this equation to work with. If this distance is d, and this distance is d plus a, the magnitude of the force is going to be this. That's it. And I know the total force will be upward because these two are closer together than these two. Since this force is upward and this force is downward, the upward force is bigger than the downward force, the entire force is going to be upward. Can we say something about the torque? What's the torque on this loop of wire? Might as well ask that. What is the torque? What is, what is the torque on this thing? All right, let's, let, let, let's just say the magnitude. What can you say? Remember, torque, torque is mu cross b, or m cross b. All right, this depends on the normal to the loop. What can you say about the torque? Right? In fact, the normal, the normal to this loop points into the board. The magnetic field points into the board. So what's the cross product? Zero. Zero. So there's no torque on this loop. There's a force. This is the force, but there's no torque. Are we okay with that? I figured I might, ask, might as well ask this since we're, we're, we, we, I can. Okay. By the way, and I don't have time to do it right now but because we're a little bit behind, but one of the questions one can ask is, yeah, I know that the force, of this the force on this wire plus the force on this wire equals zero, but could I calculate the force on one of the legs? And of course the answer is yes, but I have to set up my DF because the force along here varies. So I gotta use this. Where your B is given by this expression and your DS is your DY. And then you could do the integral. When you do it, you get a logarithm. And if you do it, if you do the for this case, in this case, you'll see that they're cancel out. I just don't have time to go through it, but that's what you would have to do if you wanted to do each leg separately to prove to yourself that these two cancel out. Okay. Here's a uh, video. This is from MIT, so I can show this video. Hold on a second. I'm going to... There's no sound. Let me go back. This, this is the force between two wires carrying current oops and the, the current is parallel nope wrong one previous slide mm -hmm. let me go to the previous slide hold on a second And I think the camera froze. Something froze. Hold on a second.
Okay, it's working now. Are you seeing anything? Hold on a second. Okay. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, it just it seems like it froze. Okay, let me try one more. Well, it's not showing in the video. What I see on the screen is different from... What I see on your screen is different from what I see on my screen. Okay, it's acting very strange. I want to make sure the camera didn't, no, the camera hasn't frozen. It's acting very strange. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to mess around with the video because I'm worried about. Yeah, the PowerPoint's not even advancing. Just give me a second here. Okay, let me let me try one more. Let me just advance. Otherwise, I'm I'm worried about having issues. So, um, if I get a chance, maybe I'll send you those videos because those are free videos, and you can take a look at them. I have I just don't have enough resources on this computer to run everything I need to run. Okay, sorry about that. So suppose I I have. What I want to do now is show you a different way we can calculate magnetic fields, but only in the case where I have a high, high degree of symmetry. So that's the next thing I want to do. Okay. So suppose we have a current carrying wire. And... What I want to do is integrate the magnetic field around the loop. I'm going to choose the loop that goes along the magnetic field vector, the magnetic field line, I'm sorry. Let's say I integrate around the loop. You might say, well, why do I want to do that? Um, I, I want to do it because I want to, I kind of want to illustrate you something. I can't do a proof using Calc 3, so I'm going to do this in this kind of a simple-minded way. I want to integrate the magnetic field around a loop that's along the field line. And I get an interesting result. Okay. Here's a wire carrying current I. And we know that the magnetic field lines circulate around the loop. I want to take the integral of the magnetic field all the way around the loop. I want to integrate over a closed path. That's what the circle means. Okay? I can use an L over S there. The dot product is simple because if I integrate all the way around the path, then uh, B is going to be par parallel to DL. I'm integrating around a path where B and DL are parallel to each other. I'm integrating in a circle. And so this dot product, the cosine and the angle is going to be zero. The distance is constant. My unit of 
of uh, arc length is rd theta, or rd phi in this case. And when I integrate this, I get mu sub zero, mu sub naught times i. That's what I get when I integrate this uh, expression. I might say, well, why is that important? It's important because it's true in general. In general, the integral of the magnetic field around a loop is mu naught times i. Now, i is the current enclosed within the loop. Does that sound familiar? I is the current enclosed within the loop. Does that sound familiar? Didn't we do something involving electric fields that was similar to it? Gauss's law? Yeah, it's like Gauss's law. This is the kind of, a, kind of like Gauss's law. So, the, so it shows you a relationship between the magnetic field and its source. Right, the, right because the uh, Gauss's law shows an, a relationship between the electric field and its source. This one's the magnetic field and its source. The reason why it's different is because of the nature of the magnetic field. The magnetic field curls. It circulates. So we're, in it, we're looking at the, the, in, the circulation of the field around a loop. Whereas in the case of Gauss's law, we're looking at how the field diverges. Now, um, the general derivation for this is, is rather complicated. Um, because of the fact that the um, current penetrates an open surface, um, because the, the current penetrates an open sur surface, when we talk about this integral, this integral has to be bonded by, this integral has to bond some sort of surface. Okay. The integral requires us to include a surface bonded by the loop. Because this wire will penetrate through some surface, whether it's this, the plane of the loop or any other surface that's contained within the loop, it's penetrating some sort of surface. Okay. By the way, this, this integral that gives you the relationship between the magnetic field and the current is called Ampere's Law. And it's related in math to something called Stokes theorem. And it's crucial that we understand that the integral requires us to include surface bounded by a loop. By the way, this is true. This is true for any time independent magnetic field.
A problem will arise with this law when we have a time-dependent field because of, because of this. Okay, so this comes, I mean, if you look at, if, you're, if you've got Calc 3 and you look at Stokes' theorem, you can see the relationship of this integral to um, how the vector circulates, how the vector curls. Okay, so why is this important? Well, just like Gauss's law, this, this relationship will allow us to determine, and I should put enclosed here, allow us to determine magnetic fields for the case of symmetry. And the restriction for using this is much higher than in Gauss's law. There's very few problems we can do. I mean, this is always true, but if I want it to be used to calculate magnetic fields, I have to have very special cases where, where I can use it. One of them is a wire. We already did it. Okay. The other one is a wire with thickness, which is a problem you have in the homework. So yeah, this is um, analogous to Gauss's law, except that here you're integrating around a closed loop, not a surface. The current I is the continuous current passing through any surface bounded by a closed path. And again, you, if you want to use it to calculate magnetic fields, you really need a high degree of symmetry. You also have to have B to be constant over the loop. Otherwise, using this for calculating fields is useless. So... The, the idea that, you know, the fact that this integral is not zero is a characteristic property of any vector that has a rotation. That integral tells you that the vector circulates. Now, the integral for conservative forces around a closed path don't have a tendency to rotate. They have a tendency to diverge. So what I want to do is, we did the wire. There's very few examples we can do. So I'm going to do some examples. Basically, there are a the few examples we can do. There's not that many we can do. Okay, I have three, and really that's it. I mean, there's, there's a couple more you can do. There's one, and I didn't assign it for homework, but there's one in the textbook you can do. It's a sheet of, um, well, just a sheet, or a strip, of, uh, or a strip, finding the magnetic field from a strip using Ampere's law. So let's do this example. I want to calculate the magnetic field inside and outside a current carrying wire of uniform current density. The radius of the, the wire is R. So this is not a filamentary current. It's not a thin wire. It's, it's a, a real thick wire. It's a cylinder. And I want to know the field inside and outside. And I want to use Ampere's law.
Okay, so let me draw the wire of, a, of, of some thickness. I'll draw the cross section also. And I want to find the magnetic field inside and outside. Okay. So let's say the wire carries current I. The total current in the wire is I. And I want to find the magnetic field outside. That's going to be easy because we did that already. I'm going to choose a loop that goes this way. So let's say the current's going this way. Oh, so you got the PowerPoint. Up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so all I did was drew this picture. So this is the wire, and then this is the cross-sectional um, area of the wire, okay? The, the red, uh, the blue, sorry, the purple. Let me do it again, because otherwise it's confusing. Let me do that. So this is the, the wire. And I want to look at the field outside. So I want to look at points R bigger than the radius of the wire. So um, I'm going to choose a loop this way. Now, if the current's coming out towards us, if the current's coming out towards us, then the magnetic field is going to go counterclockwise, right? My hands curl counterclockwise. Then I'm going to integrate in this direction so that the dot product is positive. Because if I integrate in the other direction, my dot product would be negative and then my current would be negative. That makes sense. So the direction of the current makes a difference. Because if you go in the same direction as the field, then the current's positive. If you go opposite the direction of the field, then the current's negative. So how much current is enclosed? Well, I'm gonna, okay, first of all, let's, let's set up uh, the Biot-Savart law. So like we did before, this integral is going to be B times 2 pi R, because I know that the magnetic field is going to circulate, and this is going to be mu naught times I enclosed, which is the total current. So B is mu naught I over 2 pi R for R bigger than or greater than, bigger than or equal to R. Is that okay? That's obvious, right? That's how we came up with Ampere's law. So the field, field decreases as 1 over R outside. Now what if, we, what if we want to do this inside the wire? Then I choose a loop this way. And again, I'm going to integrate in the direction of the magnetic field. So my dot product is positive. So what the heck is I enclosed? This radius is R. How do I find the amount of current that's enclosed? Uh, capital R minus R, right? Squared. Why? I will just, uh, I was skipping a few steps, hold on. <laughs> I mean, I, well, the current density is, is constant, right? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. I just, I'll, I'll gotta write it out first. 
really that's the current density for this case and then the current density times the area gives you how much current is enclosed so if this if this radius is half if this has half the radius of the entire wire then I'm going to enclose a quarter of the current does that make sense because there it goes with pi r squared So now what do I get? I get uh, these two pi's that cancel. And I get one of these r's that cancel. And so I get b is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi big r squared times little r. And notice when little r big r is equal to big r, I get this expression. So if I plot the magnetic field as a function of distance from the center, it's going to look like this. I'm going to find a spot to write here. So, this is a linear function. And then it decays as 1 over r. B is proportional to 1 over r here. B is proportional to r here. That's what the field looks like. What if the current density was not constant? What if the current density... What if the current density looked like this? Then what? I can't multiply, right? Any guys there? I can't multiply if, if my current density varies with R. Then I enclosed would be the integral of j dA, which in this case would be the integral of a r squared times 2 pi r dr. So you have to evaluate this integral. This is like what we were doing for Gauss's law. So you have a homework problem where you have to do this particular case where the, the density varies. So basically, you got to integrate this. That's it. So whatever function you have for j, you put here, and then you just integrate over 2 pi r. And, and you know what? i got to make this a dummy variable and integrate this from 0 to whatever the r is of this loop. Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. So you will see some problems kind of like what we saw in the first unit. This is one of them. Okay. But you have a lot less ex problems you can do just because of the fact that the symmetry limits us a lot more with magnetic fields as opposed to electric fields. You're not going to have, me cal have you calculate use uh, Ampere's law for a sphere. I can just, for us, if I want to use Ampere's law to calculate magnetic fields, it's mainly wires and the two next examples. So here's the next one. 
If you take a long current carrying wire and you wind it in the form of a long helix, you can produce a very uniform field. And this device is called a solenoid. And the magnetic field inside the solenoid is very uniform. The magnetic field outside the solenoid is essentially zero. And so we want to calculate the magnetic field Oops. as a function of R. So what does a solenoid look like? Well, it's basically a coil of wire. So this is an approximation to a solenoid. I'm going to show you right here. This is a coil of wire. This is an approximation of a solenoid. Typically a good approximation is you want the length of the solenoid to be much, much greater than the diameter. And if that's the case, then if you plot the magnetic field as a function of position for the solenoid, So let me, let me draw a solenoid. And if you plot the field as a function of x, where this is the x direction, the field will look like this. If you, if you put your origin at the center, your field will look like this, ideally. This is the ideal solenoid. And if you plot it radially, you essentially get the same function because once you get outside, it's zero. So how do you get the cancellation outside? Well, first of all, you have, if the current's going like this, Each one of these loops has a circulation this way. And in between the loops, you have circulations in opposite direction that cancel, that want to cancel each other out. So outside you have circulations that cancel each other out, but inside you have cancellations that add up. And as long as these coils are really sp cl uh, sp um, closely spaced together, What you'll get is a very uniform field inside and zero outside. So let's assume that and use Ampere's law to calculate the field due to a solenoid. So what am I going to do for this one? Let me, let me make this solenoid bigger. Now, I've, I've made the loops far apart, but they're supposed to be really close together. Okay, so now I want to find a, uh, a loop. I know the field's uniform, and which way is the field going to be inside here? If you go at the top and I curl my fingers around the current, you'll see that the magnetic field points this way. So this is what I want to do. I'm going to choose a loop that looks like this. I want to take the integral of b dot dl, and that's going to be equal to mu sub zero 
eye enclosed. I got to do this in four parts because there's four legs to this. This thing changes direction. It's constant. The direction of this loop, this part is constant. It's here constant, but it's, the direction is different from this one. So I actually got to break up this integral into two parts. One for this leg, one for this leg, one for this leg, and one for that leg. So, um, let me start. With this one, I'll call this one, two, three, four. I want to integrate the magnetic field along this direction. What can I say about this integral? The magnetic field points that way. What can I say about the dot product of the magnetic field with this direction? What is it? Is it zero? It's zero because the angle's 90, right? Yeah. So the first leg gives no contribution. Is there another leg I can say that for? Uh, three. Three. Okay, so three. So one and three, no contribution. Any other one? What's the Number feel four, right? here? Huh? Because it's inside. Well, the number four is outside, then the field's up zero outside, right? Yeah. So all I'm left with is this, where B is parallel. So, so B is parallel to this direction. So this is super easy. B is uniform, and it's parallel to that direction. So that's just the length. Now I got to be careful on the other side. How much current am I enclosing? Over this length. Well, I'm, I'm enclosing n loops. Each carrying current I. Every time I travel this way, I, 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 I pass some kind of current. So B is mu naught N over L times I. You can also write as mu naught little n times I, where little n is the number of turns per unit length. That's the magnetic field due to a solenoid. And the field looks like that. In fact, one of the problems I do at the end, I actually used Biot's of our law to calculate the magnetic field due to a solenoid. So let me go to that. I know that I know it's blank. Hold on a second. So, um, in your notes, I used the Bio Savar law to calculate the field due to a solenoid. And I did it for different ratios of L over R. Notice what happens to the magnetic field along the axis of the coil as L over R gets bigger. Oops. Okay, something skipped. Hold on a second. Let me go back. Let me show you the equation I got. This is the equation I got when I used the Bio Savar law. And you can show that when it gets infinitely long, you get mu sub zero n times i. 
and then you can show if you can make the graphs and show what happens as Elevera gets bigger. So that first graph shows you almost essentially the ideal case. Even even at fifty it looks good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let me go back. Study, study that problem. I have one more example I want to do with Ampere's Law. And that has to do with, whoops. That has to do uh, with another type of system called the toroid or the torus which is basically a donut with a, a tightly wound loop of wire wrapped around it. Okay, it's basically a donut with a tightly wound um, wire wrapped around it. So, what is gonna be my Empyrean loop in this particular problem. Since it's tightly wound, let me go back to the figure. Since it's tightly wound, the field inside the donut in the blue area is zero. The field outside the donut in the blue area is zero. But the body of the donut, the green part that you see, it feels uniform. And so that white line that you see is my Empyrean loop. It's of radius r. So the calculation is going to be easy. And as long as it's tightly wound, this is going to be a good approximation to the magnetic field. So let me do this one, and then I'll essentially be done with class and the chapter. And I didn't bring a torus, a toroid. The toroid is actually important in, in uh, plasma physics and fusion because you can actually get a, a toroidal field to contain particles within a plasma. Or if you've ever heard of a tokamak. Tokamaks are these devices with a donut that produce a donut shaped field. They're at national labs. So here's a torus. This is the little radius, and this is the big radius. And there's loops of wire wrapped around. And my Empyrean loop will be this. And I'm going to integrate around the, the direction of the magnetic field, so it doesn't matter which way the current's going. I'm going to take the integral of B dot ds, dl, and it's going to equal to mu naught I enclosed. So this radius is R. Okay, so because the field's uniform, then all I'm going to get is for this for this thing I'm going to get b times two times pi times r, and how much current is enclosed? Well, it depends on the number of loops I I, I cross. Each loop carrying current i, so b is equal to mu naught n i over 2 pi r. So the magnetic field then, as a function of r, is zero until you reach this inner radius, pops up, then decreases as 1 over r, and then it goes to zero when you get to this point and outward. Okay? So I've done a bunch of examples for the next homework. So, this is what I would like for you folks to do. 
On Monday, we have lab. On Monday, I'm going to introduce the new homework. I know between Monday and Friday, there's four days for you to do the homework, but take a look at the homework this weekend. Bring your questions on the lab on Monday. I wish the lab was closer to Friday, but I'm sorry about that. Um, bring your questions on the homework on Monday so I can answer them. Okay, because otherwise what you're going to have to do, by the way, I do put my the Physics 210R videos for the other group. I put them on Can I'm sorry, not Canvas, but I put them on YouTube. So you're always welcome to look at those videos because I solve homework problems in there. So use that as a resource in addition to asking me questions in the lab on Monday. Okay? I want to say one more thing before we go that, that I forgot to mention with, with um, Bio Savar. And sometimes I do go into too many details, but I think it's important for you guys to understand some of the subtleties. When I did the Bio Savar problem with the loop of wire carrying current, let's, it doesn't matter which direction. I calculated the magnetic field at the center of the wire. I can calculate the magnetic field along the axis outside the plane of the wire. And I don't know if any, if any of you folks thought about it. You know, you might say, why can't I, why doesn't he calculate the magnetic field some point off axis? And the reason why I don't do that is because of the fact that when you, you can set up the integral, no problem, but you can't evaluate it. You can't evaluate it into an, an analytical function that you're familiar with. Okay, so there's some problems, you know, we did this with the electric field too, when we did the electric field at the center of a charged ring. We just did the center because we couldn't find the field off axis because you wouldn't get an integral you can evaluate with functions you're familiar with. Because there's more advanced techniques where you can write your integrals of power series and then do the integral, but that's a pain. We're not going to do that here. Okay, so um, if you were wondering about doing this problem off axis, we can't do it. Okay. The straight wire ones you can do for any, essentially, any geometry. The integrals are doable. Just the cross products might get complicated. So all I'm saying is the number of problems I can give you with magnetism is much more limited than with the electric fields. Okay, so I'm a little bit over. Do you guys have any questions before we leave? No questions? You ready to go? Uh, well, I have a question. Are you going to post the, the grades for the exam right after this? Yeah, I will. I, and I didn't do it after lunch because it took me a while to get my lunch ready. But I'll do it, I'll okay. do it right, right when I'm done. Okay. All right, Thanks good. for asking. Yeah. Anybody else?